so great to be here and it's such a difficult thing to follow that wonderful video but in a way it is very much um, a good segue because um, I do believe that personal responsibility is behind not only what I have done but what every one of us should be doing and I always tell everybody particularly when I was doing my entrepreneurial activities that um, my mother, um, who was love personified, you know, she would always say, Candace, no matter what, if it doesn't work out, I love you. <laughs> and when you're an entrepreneur and you're going forth and you're creating new things, it's very nice indeed to have that unconditional love of your mother, who also then gave to each of her children, together with my father, both of whom were very, very poor when we were growing up and when they were growing up in the United States, the possibility to dream and to do great things, but also to always do it because um, it was making the world better. Um, so I'd also like to just talk a little bit about this idea about disruption, because I agree with, I think it was Bill this morning, this afternoon, when you know he questioned the word disruption. For me in my life, and I'm 65, so I'm not 70, but I'm 65, um, the, um, the, you know, I never ever really thought about disruption. I thought about creation. I did think about revolution and the fact that when something that I had done had brought about a revolution, had changed the world for the good, that then this gave me a happy day. So I tend to think in terms of happy days when change for the good has been brought about. And, you know, I think we are all so fortunate today because we can make a difference in just about everything that we do. We can, you know, we can, we can make sustainable energy happen. We can make a better environment. We can um, take away illness. We can destroy poverty. We can de destroy illiteracy. We can literally save the world. And it's really, if you do have that feeling of personal responsibility, you can really do all of these things. <clears throat> and also, for all of you who are students, you know, I tell every single person, I do believe that every single person has their own talent and that there's something good in every single person. And I also tell everybody, think big. You know, it's just as easy to do little things as it is to do big things. But if you do think big, and perhaps you only reach half of it, you'll reach much more, and you'll have made much more of an impact than if you had just thought small. And you'll also go outside of yourself, and you will force yourself to grow. So today, we really do have the whole world in our hands. And it's been a great afternoon, and so I'd like everybody just to stand up and get out your smartphones. Here we go. Yep. Okay. Got your smartphones? I had to borrow this and a watch, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, where are your smartphones? I can't see them. I can't see them. Get them way up there, way up there, way up there. Okay. I've got the whole world in my hands. 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 I've got you and me, sister. In my hands, I've got you and me, brother. In my hands, I've got the you and me, the universe. In my hands. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, you really do. 
You can literally, with a push of a click, with a program, with an app, you can make the world better. And you know, uh, this afternoon at lunch we were talking and somebody says, oh, are you going to talk about small businesses? And I said, no, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurs because small businesses are absolutely wonderful, but they do not bring about change. And that is what entrepreneurs do, as Bill was saying when he talked about Schumpeter. So um, I would like to, you know, somebody when I was at one of these conferences, uh, somebody said, okay, you have to turn to your person to your right, and you have to tell them, you know, what drives you. And I hadn't quite figured out that personal responsibility was what drove me, but I did know that I liked to right wrongs. And over the years, that righting the wrong and democratizing access has kind of become a leitmotif in my life. And I'd like to share with you just a few um, case histories, which are my own, or while at one time I was said, I was called Europe's most dangerous woman, or enemy number one. Uh, and Francois Mitterrand said to uh, Mr. Genscher, so the president of France said to the, the uh, foreign minister of Germany, this woman is going to sell Europe's skies to the Americans. And I retorted, and you'll see a little bit later, that I said, no, I bought America's skies for Europe. <laughs> so um, my life has been a life of being in satellites. And it doesn't really matter if it's personal responsibility that is making you get up every morning, or if it is um, uh, mobile phones, or big data, or gastronomy, or music. Whatever your tool is to make the world better, to have an impact, that's what you need to do. And you need to follow that. And so in 1957, when I was five years old, indeed, the first satellite ever came. And I, of course, did not get a satellite model like that. I got a satellite model like the little um, uh, uh, um, flying saucer in the middle of that Christmas tree. And inside, Santa Claus was there. Yes. So from that point on, when I was five years old, by the way, that flying saucer is on my, on my Christmas tree every year. You can all come. And many of the EDEC MBA students have actually come to my home at Christmas because I always invite the EDEC MBA global students to come for Christmas at my home. And they have seen this little satellite um, flying saucer. So that inspired me. From that point on, I thought, my gosh, Everything good comes from satellites. Santa Claus is up there. And my father was the um, special advisor to the president of the United States for the Apollo mission. And he told me, he said, Candace, one day we will have satellites for education, for entertainment, for telecommunications. And when we have wars, we will have wars with satellites and we will have peace on Earth. He said this in 1962, so he was really quite ahead of his time. So when I grew up, when I was 28 years old, I married my husband. Now my husband, besides being very cute, was the ambassador of Luxembourg to the United States. And you know, Luxembourg is a very, very small country uh, next to, of course, France, and it only has 500,000 people. But they were having a crisis. They were having a steel crisis, a broadcasting crisis, and a financial crisis. And I, who had just married my husband, I felt the personal responsibility to help Luxembourg have a new pillar for them to continue to be independent. And so I told the, the prime minister of Luxembourg, who was 70 at the time, I said, you know, you could have a satellite system. Now, during my five years to 28 years, I had indeed started many satellite systems in the United States. And so I said, you could have a European-wide system. 
Now, this was in 1983 by this time. And the Europe did not look like it, this footprint, the cover zone of that Astra satellite. The Astra satellite is a satellite that I started. In 1983, there was a line through Europe. There was Eastern Europe and there was Western Europe. And, you know, but I didn't see that line. I just saw that with the satellite, that we could bring cultures together, that we could bring the East and the West together, that we could have true communication, and that we could democratize access to television so that citizens could have freedom of choice. This is what I'm talking about when I say personal responsibility. It never entered my mind that this satellite system which I then grew to be the world's largest satellite system, would make billions of money and trillions, actually, for creating industries in Europe and then the world. The thing that drove me was this idea of bringing freedom of choice to Europe's citizens. And when, in 1995, People uh, ask me about Elon Musk, and Elon Musk is doing amazing things. But actually, in 1995, so I, I created the first private satellite system in the world in 1988 with that Astra satellite system. And in 1995, I created the first private um, launcher between Khrunichev in Russia and Lockheed Martin in um, the United States, so a private launcher to launch my satellite on top. You can see that Astra logo in 1995. And this was because I wanted to use space for international cooperation and to achieve peace. And today, even though still we may be at loggerheads in uh, Europe and in the United States, with China and with Russia, the one thing where we are in total cooperation with is still in space. And this makes me very, very happy. Now, you know, when you are very successful, you become a target for people. And so my Astra satellite system which I had started, and by the way, we had to totally bootstrap it. Nobody believed in us. We were doing the first private transporter satellite system in the world. We had one person who believed in us who gave us $1 million. Um, by, in 19, we launched our first satellite in 1988, and 11 months later, the wall fell down. And because I had seen this idea of having a total combined Europe. We were the only ones who covered all of Europe. And so we became very successful right away. And everybody wanted our satellite system. And they tried to take it over. And so much so that the three people who we had helped, Leo Kirsch, Rupert Murdoch, Silvio Berlusconi, get their satellite television systems onto our satellite, they tried to take our company over. And all of the board and the bankers, except for me, said, OK. And I said, no. If this happens, the freedom of choice that I had tried so hard to create in that Astra satellite system would be gone. And so here again, personal responsibility. I was scared, you know what? I went to the press and I told the press that a cartel was trying to take over the Astra satellite. And if this happened, there would, no be, there would not be open skies, there would be closed skies. The press sued for my name and they, and for one year it was terrible. But finally, the Chancellor of Germany called the President of Luxembourg and said, who is this Candace Johnson? <laughs> and the president said, why? And he said, because she is not letting my friend Leo Kirsch and his friends 
Silvio Berlusconi and Rupert Murdoch take over the Astra satellite system. And Mr. Santer, the president of Luxembourg said, Ms. Johnson has always defended the freedom and the independence of Luxembourg and of Astra, and we stand behind her. As a result, Astra went on, and I made it, become the world's largest satellite system, quite frankly, so that nobody could ever take it over again. But that, that personal responsibility to the goal to, you know, to be in a situation where there were, even, there were not even any lawyers who would defend me because they were all working for those other people. Um, but you have to go through no matter what. And in 1992, when I started the Association of Private Telecom Operators, and I realized that the Deutsche Telekom was subsidizing illegally the data networks, and we did a study and we showed that it was 2.2 billion euros of illegal subsidy. And I went to the antitrust, uh, anti-cartel amt it was called in Germany, and I said, this is what's happening. And at first they said, okay, we'll, 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 we'll do something about it. And then they said, no, we're not going to announce it. And I called up the president, who I did not know, and I said, look, either you go tomorrow to the press with our findings, or I will go tomorrow to the press. No matter what, if you see that something is wrong and you have the opportunity to write it, you have to do it as hard as it, as hard as it sometimes is. And, you know, also in 1992, when finally I was not the only woman speaking at a conference, I think like today, <laughs> um, and there were other, like there were five other women, I said, wow, we have to start the Global Telecom Women's Network. And so here we are 26 years later, we've, we've you know, we publish books, we are thousands of women across the world who care about the changing culture of communications and bringing up the next generation of fantastic women. In my life, I was fortunate to be able to bring the first satellite mobile, the first satellite internet communications, to start the global board ready women. I'm a big fan of women and I'm trying to give back because everybody was so amazing to me. Um, helping kids learn how to, and women in particular, learn how to code and program with Raspberry Pi. And the edX kids who came to my students, who came to my Christmas parties, they said, Candace, what can we give you? And I said, you can give me Raspberry Pis for the kids in Syria and, and, in Leban and the Syrian kids who are in Lebanon in the refugee camps and who are now being trained on Raspberry Pi to learn how to code and program. Um, and this was a $5,000 investment. This was nothing, you know, but look at the impact. UNICEF has taken over our program and our Arabic language Raspberry Pi to be able to do this. And, you know, so four years ago, I started Oceania Women's Network Satellite with other women in the Pacific, and um, we created Pacific. So bringing, you see all those islands there? We're bringing high throughput internet to those islands via satellite, of course. It's only women. Only women are allowed to invest. And we do all of the work on the ground. And we're bringing to schools and to hospitals communications. And more because of the climate change, so many of these islands will disappear. And we're also then saving lives by bringing in time communications. And, you know, today the challenges are different than what they used to be when I was doing my first satellite systems. Today we have space debris and we have the earth to take care of. And so here again, it is satellites that I'm working with to do space situation awareness to track the debris and to look at the Earth with hyperspectral imaging to be able to take away the pollution, to take away the, the, the possibilities of forest fires, of pipeline leaks, etc. And, you know, still trying to create new access for 
women. Um, just recently, I've been involved in helping the first women, German women astronauts come into space. And I'll conclude my, my um, uh, presentation today uh, by telling a little anecdote. Um, when I had my second business idea for the Steinway Hour, I crashed a party where I knew Mr. Steinway was going to be. I was only 24 years old. And I went to him. He didn't know that I had crashed the party. So I said, wow, you know, Mr. Steinway, I have this great idea for the Steinway Hour. And he says, oh, that's very nice. You know, please send it to me. And of course I did. And then I called for the next six months every day. And finally, I used the old trick. I didn't know it was an old trick because I was very young at the time. And I called him at 7.30 in the morning when the, when the secretary wasn't there. And he said, Miss Johnson, did you believe my secretary when she told you I wasn't there, I was in a meeting, I was on the phone? And I said, yes. And he said, OK, we'll do the Steinway Hour with you. Now, the moral of the story is not that I was persistent or that I persevered. The moral of the story is that it never occurred to me that he did not want to speak with me. <laughs> I did believe the secretary. <laughs> and you know? When you're taking on what other people would consider to be great challenges, but if you believe that you are doing the right thing and that you can do it and that you have the personal responsibility to do it, you will succeed. And I look forward now at the cocktail, hopefully, to speaking and hearing from all of you about what you're going to be doing to make the world better. Thank you.